Welcome to the Science of Success. Introducing your host, Matt Bodner. Welcome to the Science of Success, the number one evidence-based growth podcast on the internet with more than 3 million downloads and listeners in over 100 countries. In this episode, we discuss the female and male brains. Are they different? If so, what are the differences and do they matter? We look at the science behind all of this and unlock key insights into how you can improve your health, happiness, and relationships by using these simple strategies with our guest, Dr. Luann Brizendine. I'm going to tell you why you've been missing out on some incredibly cool stuff if you haven't signed up for our email list yet. All you have to do to sign up is to go to successpodcast.com and sign up right on the homepage. On top of tons of subscriber-only content, exclusive access, and live Q&As with previous guests, monthly giveaways, and much more, I also created an epic free video course just for you. It's called How to Create Time for What Matters Most Even When You're Really Busy. Email subscribers have been raving about this guide. You can get all of that and much more by going to successpodcast.com and signing up right on the homepage or by texting the word SMARTER to the number 44222 on your phone. If you like what I do on Science of Success, my email list is the number one way to engage with me and go deeper on what I discuss on the show, including free guides, actionable takeaways, exclusive content, and much, much more. Sign up for my email list today by going to successpodcast.com and signing up right on the homepage. Or if you're on the go, if you're on your phone right now, it's even easier. Just text the word SMARTER, that's S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. I can't wait to show you all the exciting things you'll get when you sign up and join the email list. Have you ever desperately wanted something and then as soon as you get it or as soon as you achieve it, you seemingly toss it aside and move on to the next thing? In our previous episode, we explored the powerful brain science behind why this happens. We looked at dopamine, how it shapes your behavior, why it causes you to do certain things and motivates you to achieve new things, but also why it can be dangerous if it becomes too imbalanced. We shared strategies for enhancing and harmonizing with your brain's dopamine circuitry and much more in our previous interview with Dr. Daniel Z. Lieberman. If you want to finally break free from the cycle of chasing your tail, listen to that episode. Now for our interview with Dr. Brizendine. Today, we have another unique guest on the show, Dr. Luann Brizendine. Dr. Brizendine is the founder of the Women's Mood and Hormone Clinic and a neuropsychiatrist at UCSF. She's the author of the New York Times bestselling books, The Female Brain and The Male Brain, and the executive producer of the 2017 movie, The Female Brain. She has served as faculty at both Harvard and UCSF, and her work has been featured in the Harvard Business Review, The Guardian, and much more. Dr. Brizendine, welcome to The Science of Success. Hi, Matt. Thanks for having me. Well, we're very excited to have you on the show today and to really explore some of the topics that you've researched and, and written and spoken about. Before we get into kind of the meat of your work, I'd love to start with something that we were hashing out and just started to have a really interesting conversation about in the in the pre-show that I think is really relevant for the listeners. And this is the idea of science as a decision-making framework. How do you think about how we integrate and use scientific knowledge to make better decisions? Well, I think one of the things that when you're in the scientific world, you're so cognizant of the fact that everything that we know today, you can ask me a question today, what as of today do I know to be true? And um, I can only tell you what I know to be true today, but I can also tell you about, well, we're not quite sure about this and we're not quite sure about that. So we're doing more work on these things so that, you know, maybe five years from now, we'll have some different answers for you. So it's always this, this issue of sort of hedging your bets, even about what you know to be true today. But in science, I think it's confusing sometimes to the public because 
we are, as scientists, always hedging our bets. And we also do know three or four things that are kind of lurking in our peripheral vision that may do something to change our theories a bit or to change what we think is scientifically true a bit. So we're always kind of, as scientists, holding what we know is true today, but that tomorrow it may not be quite as true. But for the public, it feels like, well... If something is sort of hedgy, if someone's hedging on it, an expert's hedging on it today, what can we really believe? You know, is science really true or is science not true? And so I, th I think that's an unfortunate conclusion that sometimes the public makes is you throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't sort of focus on something that can be actionable, some really important piece of scientific information that we know to be say 98% true today, that you could take in your life and make it actionable and really help yourself. So I encourage your audience to take some of the scientific truths of today for just what they are. They are the truths of today, which doesn't mean that we're not going to have modifications of them in coming years. And what would you say to somebody who thinks to themselves or even has a friend or family member who's, who says something like, well, science gets stuff wrong all the time. I'm just going to ignore it or I'm just going to go with my gut or I just don't believe that. So I would just say that, of course, science gets things all wrong all the time and they get many things wrong. A lot of things they, of course, get right. But the process and the progress of science is constantly questioning, okay, is this thing that we just showed in this experiment, okay, how true is it? And is it true in all situations? So let's do another set of 10 experiments to test that out to see if that theory is true in other situations. So science is always constantly, the whole goal of science is to test, 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 to make sure that what we think is true really is true. So we are constantly questioning ourselves as scientists, questioning our theories. That is just part of the progress of science, but it is the, the heart of the scientific process itself. You know, we're kind of getting out on a tangent a little bit, but it, to me, somebody like a Carl Sagan is such an intellectual hero of mine because he really popularized and taught and, and shared people the power of the scientific method and constantly questioning yourself, constantly testing your assumptions and how that can be a very useful and impactful way to think about the world and to think about your life. Absolutely. I, mean, I think that Carl Sagan is also a hero of mine because um, of the way of thinking about science and the scientific method. And I think that I think this is why it's kind of important for all of us to have at least a little bit of scientific learning through different parts of school is so that we can we kind of understand how scientists think and they're. And scientists never claim to have the absolute once and for all truth about something. Scientists are always experimenting and trying to move the ball further and further down the field. And ultimately, that, that questioning and that constant testing gets us to stronger answers and moves us towards a more robust understanding of what is really true. Absolutely. And I think, you know, especially in, I mean, I'm so aware of that in my field, which is looking lots at the brain connections and the brain aspects of gender differences in the brain, because the male and female brain are more alike than they are different. After all, we are the same species, right, Matt? I think so. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes. And so there's so much involved in that and what we what we do know is that you know from the moment of conception when that sperm enters the egg if the sperm is carrying an x the baby will be female if it's carrying a y the baby will be male and so from the moment of conception onwards we are we are gendered if you will well you're going to be male or female and at 8 weeks of fetal life the male tiny testicles start to put out huge amounts of testosterone that marinates the brain and body of the male fetus, changing the brain and the body into male. So by the time we're all born, we're either born male or female. And that doesn't mean that we're obviously not different species, but we are a version. We are a version of humanity. You're you end up being a male version of humanity or a female version of humanity. Most everything works just about the same, but there's a whole bunch of different things and different parts of the circuits, like the area for sexual pursuit is about two times larger in the male brain right from the get-go, and that's made 
during that fetal life and is then triggered by all of the testosterone surge at age 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, you know, in males during male puberty, that whole system is like turned on like a light bulb. And it's important to know that that's completely the natural normal unfolding of of the of the male sex that's that's how you guys are wired in females we are you know we are developed from that moment of conception until we're born without testosterone so the absence of testosterone lets our circuits develop in the female or the default mode the default mode in a way is the female circuitry and then of course during puberty we get all the estrogen surges and the progesterone surges and we shape our circuitry our behavior our motivations are tilted in the female direction so these things are built on those principles so those those are the principles that we understand that we know and those haven't changed really from our understanding for the last 50 years that that different aspects of it of course and new elements of how that happens and some ways in which it can be a bit different happen like the same sex attraction that happens in um, if you're going to be same sex attracted that usually happens in puberty for both males and females that unfolds in that direction we don't understand much about how that happens for different brain circuits but we know that all of the aspects of who we're going to be sexually attracted to happens usually at the unfolding of puberty. So before we dig into some of the puberty effects on the brain, I want to come back to this fundamental premise and perhaps even explore a little bit or, or hear about your journey and your story of how you came to some of these conclusions that the, the male and the female brain are in fact different. Right. So I just sort of laid out how the science goes, how the biology and the unfolding of if you have a Y chromosome, you're going to develop in the male direction. If you have an X, you're going to develop in the female direction. Now, that says something about how your brain circuits and your body and your genitals, how they develop. That's just biology. I mean, that's how the biology unfolds. But I think that what happens is that, that many people then try to take that into other realms, like, oh, does that mean girls aren't good at math and that boys are better at, at math? And, you know, basically, both brains can do the same kinds of things. You know, we are e there's an equal number of high, high, very high IQ females as there are high IQ males. So the aspects of intelligence and the aspects of other parts of how the brain functions aren't different. The male and female brain are, like I said, they're more alike than different. After all, we are the same species. The parts that are different have to do with reproduction and basically the means of reproduction or the, the seeking out a sexual partner to reproduce, those are made in different ways categories, male and female. So that's kind of how we all kind of get started in life. That doesn't necessarily mean that the only thing we are is male or female. I'm, you know, I'm a female who like happens to really like science. Um, Matt, you may be a male who, you know, maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe you like to, maybe you like uh, costumes or fabrics. I don't know. I mean, you know, it doesn't, what, whatever it is that you happen to be interested in doesn't necessarily only have to do with which sex you are. So tell me more about these changes or these differences in the brain and how it impacts male and female behavior, especially around reproductive behavior. So I think one of the things that I like to talk about, and I talked a lot about that in my book, The, the Female Brain, which I think, I know a lot, when a lot of guys sort of read that, they say that especially chapter two, which is the, the teen girl brain uh, chapter, really explains a lot about kind of what it's like to be a teen girl in terms of looking at it from the brain perspective. And for example, as the estrogen progesterone, you know, cycles start to happen after a girl goes through puberty, all kinds of things get stimulated in her brain that are like she gets very interested in her appearance. And I mean, you probably know some some both of you guys know some girls in your life that are like they're really into dressing a certain way. They want their shoes to be a certain way, their hair, their makeup. And, you know, I can remember myself at that age, like I would read in those days. It was like the 17 magazine or all the girls magazines. I wanted to know what you know what it what it would be like. I wanted to look like 
I wanted to be hot. You know, I wanted to be, I wanted to be, have males be attracted to me. And what was I going, you know, how did I do that? How did I figure that out? Girls are trying to figure that out all the time because part of their biology and their hormonal triggering of the motivation, the behavioral motivation in their brain to look hot and attract the opposite sex if they're opposite sex attracted is basically to spend time on their appearance, figure out how, what that's going to be like, how you're going to get guys to be attracted to you is kind of the the subtext of that urge and that motivation. I mean, it's almost like the, the hormones that trigger your hunger. You know, these things are sort of built in biologically. We don't think that they are. We kind of think, oh, I mean, I know a lot of guys that I've talked to there in the age, the teenage age group, they feel like, you know, and I have a 29 year old son. So he goes, I was like, mom, I just can't stand it. All these girls with all this makeup and all the time they spend on this and their hair. And he says, just, you know, he says, why are they doing that for? It doesn't make them look any better. You know, that, so that's from a guy's perspective. <laughs> but from the women's perspective, it's very different. It's trying to attract male attention is how the female brain is wired during those stages of a female's life. And on the flip side, the male at age 13.5 is the average age of male puberty. And we kind of measure that by the, the age of the first wet dream is 13.5. So we know that all the systems are working by then. Girls are about age 12.1 if they're Caucasian. Asian girls are a little later, like about age 13. Um, African-American Hispanic girls are a little bit younger, more like 11. So female puberty happens, say, between somewhere between ages 10 and 13. And their circuits are going to light up in wanting to be spending more time being attractive. The males, on the other hand, once their testosterone goes up, you know, from about 15 or 20 up to a level of 300, 400. And of course, by the time you're about 19 years old, your testosterone level can be up to the level of 800 to 1000. So it really it has a very rapid curve straight up during ages like 13, 14, 15. And that turns on all of the circuits that I call the that area for sexual pursuit. Guys are like they're tracking they're tracking things. Every pair of breasts that walk by catches their attention. Um, all kinds, you know, all kinds of of sexual interest all over the map for boys. And their thoughts of sex come rapid fire. Anything, anything can make them think of sex. And that's just, you know, that's a teenage boy's um, <laughs> motivation, interest in their biology is all, you know, hooked into that, as it were. So that's how the hormones and biology are motivating their behavior. I mean, it's not the only thing they're doing. It's not that they're not going to do their homework or they're not going to, you know, practice whatever sport they're doing, but they are going to have this other thing. It's almost like having, you know, you walk into a sports bar and the TV is, this, is always on in the background. It's like this kind of like whole area for sexual pursuit is always on in the background after a male goes through puberty. That's just how you're norm normally naturally wired. So I think that it's interesting when females, when girls find that out, you know, that that's, that that's what's going on in the male brain. They're quite shocked, actually. And then I think when, when guys figure out what's going on in the female brain at, that, at their stage, it's, it's also very interesting, especially when you have your first girlfriend and you may get into the areas of the other area I study, which I study PMS and, and kinds of the mood issues of the menstrual cycle is another one of my areas of expertise. So there's, there's a whole lot of, of interest, I think, in young males trying to figure out what that's about since the female brain and their hormones changes, you know, up to 25% a month, certain areas can go through a lot of uh, hormonal structural changes. And during these, uh, this sort of onset of puberty, these hormone levels are spiking to, forgive me for probably botching the numbers, but I mean, it's like 10x, 20x, 50x, huge spikes, right, for both men and women of different hormones. Yeah, so I have a I have a graph on page thirty three of my book called The Male Brain that takes the the male from age like about eleven years old to eleven years old to fifteen. Yes, that curve goes like straight up like times twenty five. You know, it's just a a twenty five fold increase in in testosterone levels. So the you know that's the testosterone is going to be making male 
beards grow, hair growth, you know, makes your Adam's apple grow larger, your voice is going to change and get deeper, penis gets larger, testicles get larger, all the male character, sexual characteristics get larger, the muscle ma- your muscle mass starts to change a lot because testosterone is a huge growth factor for muscle. So males are, you know, just like turning into the male body that we all know, and that's, that's happening at that age. So how did your research change or shape your perceptions on whether or not or which gender roles are socially constructed and which are more biologically skewed? That's a great question because that gets us into to the taking it out somewhat of the biology, but not as much as you might think, but putting it into. So how much is the construction of which gender we are happened by the way we're raised? or the way culture raises us, like the um, phrase, boys don't cry, right? So like, man up, boys don't cry. When you say that to a four-year-old who's just, you know, fallen down on the soccer field and like ripped the, rip the skin off his knee, you know, that is a cultural overlay onto like telling that little boy what's acceptable and what's not acceptable based on his gender. And so those kinds of, or, or just al- maybe allowing, encouraging little girls or comforting little girls more when they cry, let's say. The meaningfulness of those kinds of behaviors towards children based on which sex they are don't go unnoticed. We all will respond to what we're encouraged or discouraged from doing. You look at three and four-year-old boys in preschools, a woman named Eleanor Maccabee down at Stanford worked for about 40 years in the preschool setting, taking detailed research of all the behaviors of the boys and girls who played in this their playgroups. And, you know, little boys would very quickly kind of start to like, start, they would sit down with the little girls maybe and play what's called this role play type of thing where the little girls say, okay, you be the daddy and I'll be the mommy. Or you'll be the doctor and I'll be the patient. And little boys will sit and go through maybe one turn or two of that. And then they're like up and wanting to run and do stuff with the other, like, come on guys, let's go get them. They want to fight the enemy. So that these behavioral modalities, about you know 90% of little girls are more interested in what's called relationship play at that age than little boys are. Little boys are much more interested in kind of like, you know, fighting the enemy and they get more interested in explosions and basically having much what's called rough and tumble play. No one really taught them how to do this. It's been discovered, but this is just part of the way boys tend to be wired, or at least 90% of them. And they are then culturally reinforced for that. And or maybe the 10% of little girls who prefer the rough and tumble play, they may be discouraged a bit from that. So I think the way things have changed in the last 25 years is basically having more um, allowances for just having the individual child develop along whatever path they choose, rather than trying to impose sort of the, the cultural mandates on them of how a little girl versus a little boy is supposed to behave. But that being said, those things that are culturally mandated either by your family or by your school or by your peers or by your your peers' families, whatever the source of it is, don't go unnoticed. And we start to craft who we are in terms of our personhood based on our gender by these experiences we have that either provide us an outlet to be encouraged or discouraged from certain behaviors that are considered gender specific. You made a comment, and this might be pulling from the depths, and, and forgive me if this is, is out of left field, but you made a comment in your Google talk, which was which was some time ago, that you said that nature versus nurture is dead, and something around that. And I was curious that that particular line really stuck out to me, and I wanted to know what you meant by that. And I think it might fit into the context of what we're talking about now. I'd love to hear you elaborate on it. Exactly. I mean, the the old theory was that, you know, that everything was nurture and not very much was nature, right? That everything, the gender was completely socially constructed and that everything was nur- based on nurture, whether you became a boy or a girl. And of course, the biology that I just told you about is, is very clear and that, you know, that that is nature. But the other piece that we also know is that all of the things that are the nurturing things we talked about or the environment or the, the cultural mandates about gender, those start to act also upon the brain. So, you know, your, your learning and behavior all start 
like like if you're if you're punished for crying as a little boy, then that becomes part of your inhibitory brain circuits. Your brain circuits start to shut down that behavior, shut down the, you know, whenever you want to start to cry, you'll just start to shut that down. That doesn't, that is not just only kind of a conscious decision, but your actual brain circuits start to develop in such a way that they will shut those behaviors down. I mean, you can watch how, if you train dogs, right, you train you train animals and you basically have them rewarded or punished for doing certain things, it starts to become part of their brain circuit. So that's why the, how you're nurtured or how your culture mandates certain things, it becomes interwoven into the brain circuits. So that becomes nature, nature. So that nature and nurture are really not different. They are the same thing. That's why the, the nature nurture dichotomy is dead. Pavlovian conditioning is such a powerful mental model. It's really interesting to hear how it can play into childhood development and even gender roles to some degree as well. Absolutely. It's, it's part of, I mean, p- part of that is true for all of us. And that's why, you know, really trying to enhance each individual's, um, to maximize each of our own creative and intellectual potential, you know, is what I think as a society, you know, we, we are trying to work towards with, with all children. That would be the, certainly the ideal to work towards. And that's another point that you brought up earlier that I think is worth rehashing and bringing up is this idea that a lot of these behavioral patterns are are more like a standard distribution that have a lot of overlap with some differences and each individual may be on one you know one side or the other distribution and they may exhibit a lot of tendencies that may not may be sort of atypical or different but every individual is totally unique in the way that they interact with the world and their preferences behaviors and that kind of thing Exactly. I mean, like, I think like if I kind of I kind of think in pie charts sometimes because it's helpful to like like the pie chart of me who I am when I was second, third grade. I really I really enjoyed I would say I was kind of like more of a tomboy, you know, and that meant that I liked I liked to go with my the neighborhood boys next door and go out and hunt for lizards and snakes. I mean, I was into the reptiles, so <laughs> that was not very girly. I mean, it's not like, but I still, I also had my dolls. So I also had, you know, I also had girl toys and I, I definitely liked fashion and I liked fabrics and I liked, you know, I liked designing clothes. So for my dolls, so I had these, you know, I had, those were, you know, those were all parts of me and who I was. Uh, I always went, I was fishing with my dad, you know, from the time I was about three or four. So I, you know, I could put a hook into a fish, you know, I could gaff a fish and, and unhook him, you know, from the time I was pretty young. But those are, those are things that were kind of both because of my a family of origin, but also because nobody told me I couldn't go hunt for lizards with the boys in the neighborhood, right? So those are parts of me that were maybe not, some of them might have been supposedly in the other category of being more boy things. But I think that everybody has, you may fit right in the median on some of your tendencies and you may feel fit two standard deviations off in other areas, which is like, that's not, that doesn't mean anything is wrong with you. It's just how you as an individual and your particular genetics are wired. This might be getting a little bit off topic, but I, I'm curious, how have you dealt with people who would characterize your research as furthering gender biases? Well, I can understand that if you just take it on a very simplistic, superficial basis and not having read anything I wrote, I mean, you know, if you just kind of think of like, oh, someone talks about the male and female brain, that's just going to reinforce gender stereotypes and blah, blah, blah. So um, I can certainly understand it, you know, from that kind of very superficial perspective. On the other hand, um, I talk about, you know, the stuff I talk about is, you know, just basic science of hormones, behavior, and biological development. I think stereotypes are very dangerous, actually. And so, you know, as a, you know, some of these the um, the studies where they will read read some girls that are maybe junior high, they'll read them a paragraph about how girls can't do math and all this stuff, and then they'll take another and then give them a test. Then they'll take another group of girls and tell them how girls are good at this and good at other things and can be good. Those girls. Maybe they all have the same IQ, and the girls who are told that girls aren't good at math will do badly on or do worse on the test than the other girls. So that's that's one of those, I think, a profound study that shows the negative aspects of stereotypes, of gender stereotypes. So I think we all have to guard against gender stereotypes, racial stereotypes, 
all kinds of stereotypes are just, they're very offensive to the individual that you're trying to deal with because that person, you have no idea who that person is, where they came from, what their background is, what their talent sets are, what the, you know, it's very, you know, we, the reason brains like to deal with stereotypes is it's, it's, it's an ability to have shorthand. Our brain likes to be able to make up shorthand for something so that we don't have to think too hard, right? <laughs> Every individual that you run across in your life, ideally, you would take them as being someone you would just like to learn who they're about, what they're about, what their background is, and you don't come to them with any stereotype, and you just wanted to let them kind of flower the way they are. So that's, you know, that's the that's my comment on stereotypes, but I, I think all of them are bad. I want to change gears radically and come back to something else you've written about, which is very relevant for me personally, having uh, a six-month-old daughter, which is daddy uh. brain. <laughs> um, tell me a little bit about that. So I think that if you start with the phrase human brain, human parenting brain, the parent, the parent brain, but I think that a lot of women, because we are the we are the ones who carry the carry the baby, birth the baby, breastfeed the baby, right? You're, that's what's going on in your household right now. Uh, but fathers are really incredibly, um, even biologically involved. They basically have found that in in the first, like within the first two or three months of the of your partner's pregnancy, if you're living together in the same house, I think this may or may not be true if someone's you know spouse is away, say in Iraq or something. But you know, if you're living with that person. And you're the father of that child, and your partner, your wife is pregnant. You start to have hormonal changes that you may or may not be aware of. I mean, you've heard of Couvade syndrome or Couvade syndrome, C-O-U-V-A-D-E. It's where the male gets basically the same kind of appetite as the female, and often gains up to 25 pounds during her pregnancy because, you know, you're you're also eating for two. But it's thought to be pheromonal slash hormonal, male's testosterone level drops about 20 to 30%. And your other hormone, which is called prolactin, P-R-O-L-A-C-T-I-N, prolactin, it means actually prolactation. It's the hormone that causes milk in the breast, but the male, males also have it. And we we don't really know what it's doing in the male brain or in the daddy brain, but it increases by 20 or 30 percent during the whole gestation of the and then after birth. So right at about six months, yours is sort of starting to go back to your pre-levels. But during that first six months of the of the baby's life, if you're living with that child, your testosterone level is still a bit low and your prolactin level is very high. So the thinking is that it's really triggering the male brain, the daddy brain, to become protective and basically to become a parent. And you've probably seen those studies where they they measure the ability of the female brain to hear an infant crying. And if the female has had babies before, um, if she's already had children versus someone who hasn't, she hears the baby's infants cry a lot more. It's a lot louder. It's a lot that she wakes her up more than a female who's never had children. But if you take a male who's never had children, he hardly hears the crying at all. But you take a dad, like, you know, once you've had the experience as well, it's not quite as robust or as for a female brain in terms of hearing an infant cry. But once you've been a dad, your ability to hear infants cry based on MRI studies of crying infants, that whole auditory circuit in your brain just lights up like a Christmas tree when you hear babies cry. But beforehand, before you ever became a dad, it was kind of you was kind of flatlined in your auditory circuits for hearing the baby cry. So I think that's very interesting to watch the actual formation of the daddy brain. I've definitely experienced that. I used to be able to sleep through a hurricane, and and now I'm like a ninja. <laughs> I can hear my daughter crying from like half a building away. I'm like, what was mm -hmm. that? Was that a cry? <laughs> you see, there you go. You're you're proof positive, Matt. It's isn't it amazing though that you watched the changes you've gone through and just the I don't know if you've just felt like that, you know, you just, just, you're in awe, you're a totally different person. And so you said after about six months, the testosterone levels start to re revert back to normal. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So you, you should be right on the, you should be right on the threshold. <laughs> Very exciting. 
<laughs> I don't know. That, and that there's all kinds of theories about why that happens, whatever. And it's like, you know, the comment is also often made, well, that keeps him, you know, he's not going to be out chasing skirts. He should be home, like trying to build the nest for his child. You know, that's the way mother nature made it so that you'll, you know, stay close to the nest and be set up to be more nurturing and protective of your, of your child. So that, that all makes sense. That's not obviously not every male does that, but about 90% of men have this phenomenon happen to them. If you're like me, you have tons of skills and abilities that you want to master. And that's why I'm excited about our sponsor for this week, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators with more than 25,000 classes in design, business, and more. Skillshare is an amazing resource to discover countless ways to fuel your curiosity, creativity, and career. Whether you're looking to discover a new passion, start a side hustle, or gain new professional skills, Skillshare is there to keep you learning, thriving, and reaching for new goals. They have some incredible courses around drawing, creating, and even an awesome course that totally piqued my interest around visual thinking and how to use visual thinking and visualizing data to communicate ideas more effectively. There's some amazing, highly detailed, and really, really interesting courses on here, and I highly recommend checking Skillshare out. Join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for Science of Success listeners. You can get two months of Skillshare completely for free. That's right. Skillshare is offering Science of Success listeners two months of unlimited access to over 25,000 classes for free. All you have to do to sign up is go to Skillshare.com slash success. Again, go to Skillshare.com slash success to start your two months right now. Skillshare is awesome. I highly recommend going to sign up, check it out. There's definitely a course or probably a number of really high quality courses and classes on exactly what you want to master in your life today. One more time, go to skillshare.com slash success and sign up now. Another topic that you've talked a little bit about and I'm very curious to dig into is how video games affect the male brain. Well, that's that's these days a very, very big question. And things are kind of like also related to the amount of minutes or hours you do this thing, right? If you're playing a video game over and over and over again, and I, I know that the major games that guys like to play are these single shooter games, right? The single shooter games are the best, so the, the billion dollar industry. And that um, kind of repetitive play, depending on how many hours a day you do it, etc. It's it basically can crowd out other things. So the effect of the video games on the male brain are it gives it gives guys great pleasure in doing that because they 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 love the the mastery the mastery that comes from being able to have the fine motor skills and also to understand stand the aspects of the game and to actually you know be able to win and to go up levels all that that's it's very a gratifying world to live in and I think the you know, the only thing that especially we look at in teen boys is that the danger becomes that that is the world they live in and that their daily diet of video games versus other things that you need to be learning to do in, you know, say, your social social world or even in physical activity world get downplayed a bit when you're doing too many hours of that. So I, I want to look at some of the conclusions or lessons that we can draw from your research whether that's communication strategies or behavior changes, how do you think about, you know, for somebody who's listening to this episode, how can we start to apply some of these lessons around the different, the, the male brain and the female brain to, to shape our behavior more effectively? Well, I think that it's, there's a generalizable thing that comes out of it, which is basically that the other, the other person in front of you is different than you are. And that really comes as a big aha moment for many of us because we like to think that other people are just like us or that their motivations and the way they will make a decision about something that's presented to them would be the same that we would do. And I think that just on a very basic foundation is that the uh, to know that the female's motivation, you know, driven to some extent by the hormonal fluctuations that are 
totally normal and appropriate are maybe driving her or urging her to do things um, that are different than would be driving you as an adult male with your high testosterone levels to do. And so this some I think that the actionable thing from this research is that that your level of understanding of being able to put yourself in the other person's shoes based on something that you've learned from this science is really, really helpful in your ability to, to deal with the opposite sex. I'd love to have uh, a specific example of that if you have one. Okay. Because I study uh, premenstrual syndrome or PMS, which is the, um, usually for about 80% of females, the three or four days or even the one or two days right before onset of your menstrual period is a time when your progesterone level has been very, very high and all of a sudden it crashes down into the pits by, you know, whatever, 10, 20 fold. And progesterone acts in the brain almost like Valium. It makes you feel pretty calm. And then all of a sudden when it drops, it makes you feel like almost like in Valium withdrawal, which means very irritable, very emotional, easily triggered. And different females, 20% don't have any of this, but about 80% will say, oh, they will become either irritable or kind of pushing you away. Or we call it in my clinic, the crying over dog food commercials <laughs> sign. Bursting into tears over something that, you know, ordinarily wouldn't make you cry. If you take your girlfriend to the movie that's like a sad movie, but, you know, maybe not that sad, she might on that day before her period starts cry easily over things. Or you may say something to her that was a little bit insensitive, but maybe not all that insensitive, just, you know, and she may just like either fly off the handle in, a, in an angry rage at you or burst into tears or or to feel rejected by you and like you don't love her or like you you know the, all of so it's an it's an emotional overreaction that can actually happen very very easily in that particular hormonal state so i think that for guys to realize that and that there's nothing you can't don't you dare say oh we honey is at that time of the month we don't appreciate that because that just makes it worse <laughs> but you know i think being on the alert about that particular vulnerability that's not, it's not about who she is, it's not who she is the whole month, but it may be just a vulnerability on that single day before her period starts. And to just be, just, just to also know that if she blows up at you, it's not, you know, if, if it's a fight that you just had that there's something need to be resolved, the guy, I tell the guy when they come to my office as a couple, I'll have him write down on a sticky or something what the issue was, put it in a drawer, and, you know, three or four days later, if it's something important to discuss, bring it up again when you're both in your best state. Another example that I've heard you share is, and forgive me if I'm misphrasing or mischaracterizing this, but this is the idea of how males will often focus on solution seeking instead of validating feelings. Oh, boy, that's a big one. Because when I was writing The Male Brain, my, my husband is a neuroscientist, too. But he's he's a guy's guy. What can I say? And I wrote this little yellow sticky for him on his computer that said, it just had the words, honey, I know how you feel, period. So whenever I would come home with something that was going on at the clinic or something at the university or somebody did this or that, and I was come, I would come home and be upset about it and telling him about it, he used to just turn to me and say, honey, you know what you should do? You should do blah. You know, he was immediately telling me how to fix it, right? He, was, he already had the solution, handed it to me, whatever. That is not what I wanted, actually. I, I needed to hear him say, to empathize with me, to say, honey, I know how you feel. And so he would now turn and read that little yellow sticky off his computer. And I was surprised because it was just a little game we had played. It was not really meant to be. I mean, I didn't realize it would have the effect it had on me. When he said that to me, oh, my God, I just my all of my nervous system just relaxed. And I was actually then more open to hearing what he had to say to try to fix it. But before, when he immediately would jump into like, you know what you should do, blah, 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 you should do this or you should, you know, it was like, I felt like he hadn't really heard me. You know, he hadn't gotten on my wavelength about how I felt about it. And that's, that seems to be a very common complaint and big difference between male and female approaches to kind of emotional problem solving. That was one that definitely resonated with me 
maybe, you know, I mean, longtime listeners of the show will probably know this as well, but I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of, of rationality and sort of cold rational thinking. And we were talking earlier sort of about Carl Sagan and the scientific process and all this. But when I encounter a problem, my, my state is always, all right, how can we rationally break this down and solve it? But the other thing that I've, I've learned over the course of doing this show and lots of interviews with tons of sci- you know, scientists and psychologists and people who talk about emotional intelligence is that there's a whole other side of, of interaction that if you're ignoring the emotional component, you're missing a, a huge piece of the ballgame. Oh, absolutely. And I think that, you know, they, they try and teach this in businesses. They try and teach it in business school and stuff now to some degrees. Like, like if you are somehow missing the emotional component of whatever is going on in the room or going on with that person or that client or that or, or your partner or your girlfriend or your boyfriend, if you're missing the emotional component, then you're not going to get buy-in from them at all about because because they don't think you get it. You don't think if you don't at least if you're not able to express that you kind of understand the emotional component of where they're at, then whatever you're trying to negotiate is is really going to fall flat. So what would be one action item or concrete step piece of homework that you would give to somebody listening to this episode to concretely apply some of the ideas and themes that we've talked about today? Well, I think guys Guys might do well to take a little yellow sticky that says, honey, I know how you feel. Put it on your computer or wherever it is you're usually in the house when she comes home and just just try it out. Do a little experiment. Do a little scientific experiment and see how that works. When she comes home or she's whatever, or, she, or she's telling you, God, do you know what my sister did? Or, did, or do you know what my, you know what my mother or my father said? You know, it's usually family stuff, right? Went and did this today, whatever, and you're listening to it and you can hear how upset she is, then you just say, honey, I know how you feel. And then just pause after that last word for a moment. So that would be something that's an actionable experiment to try because I do agree that males tend to be, they they like the process of rational decision-making so much that they get like overly, that's the part that they like the best and they, they take take some some bad experiences sometimes to to learn the other. So that would be that would be good. And I think just to understand that maybe the other person, I mean for women, it's very important to realize also that the male testosterone levels are always about ten times what yours are. And that makes sexual interest and sexual drive on the male's part on average, if you're the same age as your partner, about three times more in the male than in the female. Obviously, that's not always true, but it tends to be, on average, what studies for 50 years have found. So I think just just to understand that that's not because they don't find you attractive, that's not because they're not sexually interested in you, that's not because they don't love you, that they may not be as sexually interested all the time as you are, that some of this is hormonal stuff that's just the way biologically we are built and it's not anybody's fault or it's not anybody's it's it's not a behavior to don't blame somebody's behavior on them until you understand what might be the underlying biological principle of how they're dealing with the situation and for listeners who want to find you and your work online what's the best place for them to do that well they can just they if they want to Check out um, on Amazon, The Female Brain. There's both the book and the movie. The movie is out on streaming now. The books are easily available on Amazon, The Female Brain. And for guys in your age group, um, like guys that are like in their like late teens up to about age 40, reading chapter two of The Female Brain, which does talk about all the hormones and all of that, might be a good place for them to start. Just read that I guess it's about a 16 page chapter. It's very easy to read. And for females that are in this age group, they might want to read that chapter two, the teen boy brain. It talks about the hormones in the male brain, in the male brain, which you can also find the male brain book on, on Amazon. So that's what I would suggest. And when the new book comes out, I'm just working on a new book that's going to be about all of the sort of basically. Um, healthy aging in the brain, healthy hormones and aging in the brain. Um, we may talk about that in the future, but that one will pro- is due to come out um, January of 2020. Well, Dr. Brizendine, thank you so much for coming on the show and, and sharing all your research and knowledge. 
And uh, I think we definitely want to have you come back on and, and dig into the science of, of healthy brain aging as well down the road. Excellent. Thanks for having me, Matt. And um, I really have appreciated the opportunity to talk with your audience. Thank you so much for listening to The Science of Success. We created this show to help you, our listeners, master evidence-based growth. I love hearing from listeners. If you want to reach out, share your story, or just say hi, shoot me an email. My email is matt at successpodcast.com. That's M-A-T-T at successpodcast.com. I'd love to hear from you, and I read and respond to every single listener email. I'm going to give you three reasons why you should sign up for our email list today by going to successpodcast.com, signing up right on the homepage. There's some incredible stuff that's only available to those on the email list, so be sure to sign up, including an exclusive curated weekly email from us called Mindset Monday, which is short, simple, filled with articles, stories, things that we found interesting and fascinating in the world of evidence-based growth in the last week. Next, you're getting an exclusive chance to shape the show, including voting on guests, submitting your own personal questions that we'll ask guests on air, and much more. Lastly, you're going to get a free guide we created based on listener demand, our most popular guide, which is called How to Organize and Remember Everything. You can get it completely for free, along with another surprise bonus guide by signing up and joining the email list today. Again, you can do that at successpodcast.com, sign up right at the homepage, or If you're on the go, just text the word SMARTER, S-M-A-R-T-E-R, to the number 44222. Remember, the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to a friend, either live or online. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us an awesome review and subscribe on iTunes because that helps boost the algorithm that helps us move up the iTunes rankings and helps more people discover the science of success. Don't forget, if you want to get all the incredible information we talk about in the show, links, transcripts, everything we discuss, and much more, be sure to check out our show notes. You can get those at successpodcast.com. Just hit the show notes button right at the top. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Science of Success. Success.